thank you all for being here this afternoon. I really do appreciate it. What I'm going to be talking about is um, some of the things that I've learned from starting and growing my own niche practice that I think are going to translate not only to other niche uh, areas of the law and other uh, niche practices, but just sort of across the board. I think a lot of these are techniques that people can, can implement in any kind of practice that they have, um, primarily because a lot of these are less about practicing the law and more about how we interact with clients and our communities. Um, so a little bit about me before we get started. Um, these are some fun facts. Perhaps the most interesting is that, as you mentioned, I started my practice in 2013. And through some of the things that I'm going to talk about, um, we've served over 500 clients across 10 parishes. And by we, I mean myself and my part-time assistant. <laughs> um, so we've been very, very busy. Um, there's been a, a real need for the service that we provide. And we've made ourselves available to provide that service. Um, one of my favorite quotes that's up here, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. That's a really, really useful mantra for anybody who's going to be in a niche practice um, because it's really about working with the people who are living in that niche as well. So first things first, uh, a niche doesn't have to mean narrow. Uh, my practice um, is both a legal special specialization and a clientele specialization, right? So you need to recognize that if you're working in a niche, uh, you're working with unique laws applied to unique circumstances that are surrounding unique individuals. So those are three different points at which you're going to have to take a very specific look at what people need, um, what they want, in those situations and be responsive to that. So it's never gonna be a one-size-fits-all situation, even within a niche. Even when the idea is that everybody in this very small sliver of the community is probably experiencing a singular issue, they're all gonna be experiencing it differently, so you have to be responsive to that. As well as the fact that these things are all occurring intersectionally, right? So um, the history of a client, how they get to your office, um, the full spectrum of those circumstances, again, this is, this is going to be something that I'm talking about a lot, is that you have to address the full spectrum of circumstances for your client. And in doing that, you have to understand how each of these things, um, how each of these laws are going to impact them differently. Um, because it's not just a housing issue, it's a child custody issue. It's not just a child custody issue, it's an employment issue. Um, and the way these pieces all fit together um, and I'll, I'll give some examples of that uh, as we move through this a little bit further, but these are just some, some broad ideas to keep in mind as we move along. And so even though you're working in a niche, you need to be willing to, to think about multiple foci of your, of your work, right? That, um, yes, I have a practice that primarily serves LGBTQ individuals, um, but in doing that, I have to recognize that the vast majority of LGBTQ individuals um, are disproportionately low income. They face unemployment and underemployment at a higher rate. So that's part of my practice. They also experience domestic violence and sexual assault at a disproportionately high rate from their straight counterparts, right? So that is going to be part of my practice as well, recognizing the full circumstances that are surrounding my client so that I can be responsive to all these different moving parts in a meaningful way for them. And knowing which parts of that I can't do anything about. Right, there, we all have our limits. You need to know what your limits are. You can't take on every client. You can't take on every problem for a client. But if you can recognize that those problems exist and perhaps connect them with somebody else who can help them with that, you're not just leaving them out in the cold. And that's a really meaningful way to, to build your practice as well, to strengthen those relationships that are going to be at the heart of having a successful niche practice or any practice. Um, planning makes perfect. So when I first started, I was sort of notorious um, for having these three foot wide uh, pieces of butcher paper that would have six months mapped out and there would be color coded post-it notes that would move along each month as we went along um, that had different benchmarks and goals and things like that. That was how I mapped all this out. There was an entire wall in my office for the first couple of years um, that was just covered in these post-it notes that was the planning that was how are we making connections with community? What are our benchmarks? How many new clients are we trying to get? How many of those clients are we trying to retain? What's the dollar amount we're trying to reach? All of that was, was part of having a plan. Um, and and you, you, you can't just have a goal. You have to have a plan and a pathway to get to that goal, 
right? So it's great to sort of start and say, I want to have a successful practice. Well, first you have to know how are we measuring that success? Is it going to be just the dollar amounts? Is it the number of clients? Is it the impact on the community? Um, and if we're doing it, in my case, one of my big goals was having a, a meaningful impact on my community. Well, so how am I defining a meaningful impact? You have to break it down into these bite-sized pieces. And when you do that, you're also going to break it down into manageable, um, verifiable checkpoints, right? So if having a meaningful relationship with the community means I went ahead meetings with three community organizations in the next two months, right? There it is. There's a concise, measurable way to know that I'm doing what I said I'm going to do and that I can follow that to a specific outcome, right? And that's how you're going to continue to build those sort of, those sort of connections and to build the forward momentum in your practice. Um, beyond having a plan, you need to stay informed, right? So having a plan to connect with community organizations, having a plan to grow your business is great, um, but you need to know which direction your practice should be growing into. Um, you need to be aware of your surroundings. You need to be aware of your client surroundings. Um, it's not enough to say, you know, this is the niche that I'm working in. You have to know, this is the niche that I'm working in, and this is where it's going to be tomorrow. Because if you're not on the leading edge in a niche, there's not a middle of the pack. There's a front of the pack and a back of the pack, and that's it. Um, so the leading edge is where you're going to need to be. In order to do that, my recommendation is you can't just learn the law, you have to understand the universe that the law exists in. So again, you have to understand your clients. You have to understand where they're coming from. Um, whether your client is uh, you know, uh, 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 an underemployed LGBTQ person in New Orleans, like a lot of my clients are, or your client is someone who's opening a, a cannabis dispensary in a state where that's a legal operation. Right? You have to understand where that person's coming from, what their expectations are in hiring an attorney, what their expectations are moving forward with that attorney, what are some of the things they're going to be facing, what's the next challenge that they're going to have so that you can be prepared to be right there with them when they get to that next challenge, not the one that they're dealing with right now. And opportunities aren't going to present themselves. So head on a swivel is the way it has to be when you're in a niche because, again, there's no middle of the pack. There's no getting by with just sort of doing the routine average work. You have to be on the, the leading edge to be pushing into the new and the next, but you also have to be aware that that's going to mean your practice is potentially going to take a hard left at some point, and you're going to have to be ready to take that hard left with your clients. Branding yourself is a super important part of all of this, right? So when you are in your niche, when you are in your field, um, people are going to need to be able to identify you, right? We all know that one of the most important ways that people um, find attorneys and hire attorneys is just by word of mouth. So somebody's going to have to be able to remember you, remember what you've done, remember who you are. Um, I don't know a whole lot about this. I'll be completely honest. There were a lot of great sessions at this um, conference about exactly this. Um, if, if you went to any of those, we can talk after and you can probably tell me something about it. All I know about branding yourself is it's awkward, it's uncomfortable, but it's completely necessary. <laughs> And, and that's really all I, can, all I can say is, for better or worse, my brand has been myself. And that is what we do when we are solo practitioners or we are in a niche, right? I am the product. Um, I hope the packaging is appealing, but it is what it is. Um, and it's not going to work for everybody, and I understand that. But knowing that, knowing myself, is the first step in, in making sure that I have a quality product to put forward, right? That when somebody is pulling you know, a can of peas off the shelf, they can look at the nutrition label and figure out what's in it and whether it's good for them or not. I've got to be able to explain that to my clients. I've got to be able to explain to them what's in me, what's in my practice, what is good for them about me and my practice, um, which is weird. It's not a way that we think of ourselves. It's not a way that we talk about ourselves, um, but it's a thing you have to do, and it's a thing that will reap rewards for the practice and for the client. Um, because when we're more self-aware, it's easier to put our stuff to the side when we need to and focus on clients when we need to because we can trust in our own abilities and who we are and what we're bringing to the table. When we're reaching out for clients, it's really easy to reach 
directly to those folks who are going to be impacted by what it is that we do. So, um, for example, I have a colleague, and this is sort of telling, I guess, of where I'm from, who specializes in equine law. Um, and so he works with people who buy and sell horses and that sort of thing. Um, he, when he was first starting, had a really hard time because a as an attorney, it's not exactly like he can go down to a stable and pass out cards, right? Um, so he, <laughs> he had to figure out who are people who are dealing with equine law. Well, they're people who own horses, obviously. Um, what else do people who own horses do? Um, so he started going to gun clubs and talking to them about gun ownership law and how you ensure that your legal firearms are kept legal, um, how you plan your estate to ensure that firearms are maintained and kept legal. And in doing that, he made connections with people who, surprise, surprise, own horses um, and who sell horses. And that was really what his practice was. He started sort of left of center to work his way back. So when you're, when you're reaching, you gotta think beyond the direct impact, right? Because that's super obvious, right? And that's certainly where everybody's gonna go in your niche. That's, that's the first stop. But to go one step beyond that is what's gonna put you beyond everybody else. And there's either front of the pack or back of the pack. There's no middle. Um, the power of partnerships, I know that my practice wouldn't have grown nearly as quickly or as successfully as it did without the power of partnerships. There are tons of people in all of your communities who are out there every day and have been for years working with exactly the people that you want to be your client. You do not need to reinvent the wheel in trying to connect with those people. You just need to talk to the folks who already have their relationships with them. You have to invest in the community. You have to invest in organizations you have to think about um, interprofessional relationships that you can create. So um, for myself, uh, working with the survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault, having relationships with medical prof professionals, with social workers, with counselors, that's where referrals come from. And to develop that relationship instills more trust from the client and instills more trust from the other professionals that they can send people to me and know that I'm gonna understand what the clients need and where they're coming from, and I'll treat them the way they need to be treated. Former clients obviously are a great resource as well. Um, about a third of my clients um, are Spanish speaking, either their first language or sole language is Spanish. I'm not, I, I'm not gonna put an ad on TV, partly because I can't afford it, but partly because I don't have the resources to develop a Spanish language ad to put out, so I'm dependent on my clients many of whom are undocumented, right, and don't have access to the same resources that we would think of as being um, the sources, the streams of referrals. It's, it's very tight-knit communities, the LGBTQ community, undocumented communities. Um, these marginalized communities, these niche communities have been relying on one another already. You don't need to go in and try and bring them all together. You need to go in and see how you can serve them. They'll tell each other about you as soon as you do that. And this last one, in, in perhaps the most mercenary of ways, um, is co-legal collaborations. Um, there's nothing more powerful uh, and arguably more satisfying than turning your competition into your collaborators. Figure out who your biggest competition is, talk to them, try and see if you can find a way, especially if you're just starting out as I was, to get referrals from them and then out-hustle them until you're giving them referrals. It's as simple as that. It really is that, <laughs> that if you figure out what they're doing, they already have a share of the market, they already have clients, figure out what they're doing and figure out what they're not doing and try and figure out why they're not doing it. They may not be doing it because they haven't thought of it. They may not be doing it because they don't think it's important. They may not be doing it because it doesn't work, but try it, see what happens. You may reach clients that didn't think that there was an option for them. You may reach clients who are gonna give you access to a whole new set of clients that you didn't realize were out there because you find a niche within a niche. Um, and that was certainly the case with my practice. I started working in, in LGBTQ communities and realizing that services specifically around DV and, and sexual assault weren't there. And so it was a niche within a niche that is huge. 
Um, so you have to be open to that. You have to have a head on a swivel. You have to invite those opportunities into yourself, right? You can't wait for someone else to give them to you. And it doesn't matter how long you've been doing this. It doesn't matter how good you are at it. It doesn't matter how many of your clients refer you to other clients. It doesn't matter how many people recognize you as an expert in your field. It doesn't matter how far ahead of the rest of the field you are. You're never going to be able to do it alone. It's always going to take a village, whether that village is within your own office or your community. Um, it's going to take multiple people. You're going to need to have those relationships. People are nicer than you'd think. People love being asked what their opinions are about things. Um, it makes them feel like an expert. It makes them feel important. Um, <laughs> so, you know, another piece of sort of mercenary advice, a great way to build relationships with people is to ask them um, to answer questions you already know the answer to. They love to talk about that. They'll want to talk to you about it. And when they talk to you about it, it opens up the door to have a conversation about who you are and what you do. And if you have a little spiel, and if you care about what you're doing, it gives you a chance to mirror back to them that same sense of self-value, that same sense of inspiration in what you do, and it'll snowball. And if they're feeling good about themselves, and then you're feeling good about yourself, then we're all feeling good about this together, and we're all very excited, and this is a great opportunity, and we should do this, and I'm going to refer you clients. It's a kind of mercenary thing, but it works. And at the same time, it's a, it's a great way when you're struggling in building your niche practice and you're wondering where the next client's going to come from, it's a great way to remind yourself of why you do what you do, to kind of take that opportunity to build yourself up, to let somebody be excited with you for a minute um, so that you can carry that into the next conversation that you have. I love complaining. I love complaining because it's one of the quickest and easiest ways to get what you need. Um, I will complain to anyone about anything um, because invariably, whether they want to or not, someone will help me come up with a solution. Um, people will brainstorm with me. People will offer uh, resources. Um, people will offer information. It's an old adage, but it's a good adage, right, that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Um, go to community meetings. Uh, go out to neighborhood associations. Listen to what people are complaining about. If you have grease, if you have a skill to share to help fix somebody's problem, listen to the squeaky wheel. Figure out where they are. If it works for you, the client's going to feel like it's working for them too. Um, and that's a powerful moment as well. The first answer is never the final answer. Um, it's as simple as that. So when you ask somebody for something and they tell you, no, we can't, okay. What that means is, no, we can't right now. So you come back a little while later and you ask again. And you do that over and over and over again. Um, and either they refer you to somebody else who can do what you're asking them to do, who can connect you with more clients, who can help you um, get your foot in the door with that um, you know, business association that you've had your eye on for a while. Or you know, finally, once and for all, that's it. I'm not missing out on something somebody else has, has got access to. There's just no way to make this happen. Can't ever take no as the final answer. I'm telling a bunch of lawyers that. Um, and last but not least, I'm a very firm believer in using the scientific method as I understand it um, in a very sort of broad, broad sense, um, which is, as Thomas Edison said, right, you don't fail, you just find 10,000 ways that don't work. It's not enough to say, this is the path that I'm on, I'm gonna go down it, no matter what happens. That works when you have the luxury of a cushion, whether it's financial, or the cushion of a larger firm, or the cushion of a predictable market. Um, but if you're trying to either break into or continue in, a very specific field of law with a very specific clientele, the margin of error is that much smaller. Um, and so you have to be able to move with the tide, right? You have to be able to respond quickly to what is needed um, or not needed. Um, and while responding is part of the game, and I know I've said this several times already, being on the leading edge is where you have to be. So you have to be informed. You can't just be knowledgeable, you have to be informed. You have to have information. You have to be able to predict. You have to be able to be a step ahead. 
Um, you have to really listen when clients are talking to you. One of the, the easiest ways to figure out what's going on in your field, what's going on in your community, is to listen to your clients. And if you have multiple clients with the same problem, if you have multiple clients with the same complaint, why is that? What is the thing that's going on in our society? What is the thing that's going on in this market? What's the thing that's going on in this collection of people who have a similar goal um, that's resulting in the same legal problem over and over and over again? And what can I do to get straight to that? Because if I can figure out how to get straight to that problem, if I can figure out how to solve this problem that apparently nobody else has figured out how to solve, or if I can put myself on the path that's leading directly to that problem, then I'm gonna be on the leading edge. Then I'm gonna be a step ahead. Then I'm gonna be predicting what's happening rather than just responding to what's happening. And that's gonna be really important. So I have left a lot of time for questions, so I, fo I hope folks have them. Um, but that was sort of uh, an overview of, of tips and tricks of things that I have figured out in developing a niche practice that I think translate pretty well to a lot of other fields. Anybody have any questions? Thank you.